Parshas Netzavim. Yes, yeah, yeah. It begins, Atem Netzavim Hayom Kulchem Lifnei Hashem Elokeichem. You're all standing here today in front of God. So, it's, of course, this is not your normal way of starting a Parsha. What, what does it mean you're all standing here today? So, we always have an understanding that whatever was at the end of last week's Parsha, that really ties into this week's parsha. Just because the rabbi split them doesn't mean that they're not related. Mm. And that the and last week's parsha dealt with what's called the tochacha, the reprimands, the curses yeah. that'll happen. Is this is what'll happen to you if you follow the Torah, and this is what'll happen if you don't. Right? If you don't, there are all of these things that'll happen. Now, when the Torah was given, this was prophecy, and right? this will happen if you don't follow the Torah. It's now sadly history. We've seen it happen time and again throughout the last few thousand years since the Torah was given 3,300 years ago. Um, but you can imagine if you are standing there on, on the mountains and they're giving you the, and you know, Moshe is telling us uh, all of the curses that are going to happen, and the people are listening to this, if I was them, I would be scared to death. Right? You know, you got the, the mothers will eat their children and and the ground will be like iron and there'll be no rain and and uh, you know one person will come and and chase you away and you know, hundreds of you away they're really sad and terrible things so you'd become and you'd have desperation you know right total despair you'd have no you say i'll just give up like how am i supposed to beat that you give up it's one thing if somebody you know you do something wrong and they punish you and right you'll survive you'll you wish you didn't do it and you won't do it again but sometimes a punishment can be so bad that you just give up hope that's what it sounds like here right the people became despondent so Moshe begins this partial by saying listen I know the Torah says this is going to happen but you're still here aren't you you're still alive you're still around in other words yes not that the Torah is false you know, the Torah didn't say you wouldn't be here. You imagine that it's so difficult and so impossible that you're not going to exist if you, uh, uh, you know, based on what the Torah says. So Moshe says, no, don't give up hope. You're still here today, right? You're Atem Betzabim. You're standing here today. All of you are still here today in front of Hashem. All of the tribes, all of the troops, all of the families, you're all here today. The babies, the mothers, the fathers, the converts, everybody, you're all here. Based on difference, who you are, you're here with us today. So that's a, an important opening because it's, you know, here we are right before Rosh Hashanah, and very often before Rosh Hashanah, we also have the same feelings. You know, people tell us, you know, Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment, and Hashem will look back over the year and He'll see how we did, and did we actually do what we said we would do? Did we try to do what we said we would do? Right? What What is it? You know, really. Like, what, what do we? How do we really look at, at how we were this past year? And the Torah seems to tell us that this past year, um, you know, if we didn't do what we what we were supposed to do, or we didn't grow, or we didn't get any further along the path as we said we would, the game's over. Right? Hashem gave us a chance. We didn't do it. The game's over. It's like you know, the guy says, go to court. He says, all right, look, I'm going to put you on. I'm going to give you parole. You can go out. You've got to meet with your parole officer once a month. And you can't associate with criminals, and you have to stay clean. You can't do anything wrong. If you do things wrong, I'm going to put you back in jail because it means it didn't work. That's right. So you did something wrong. Now it's time to go to the judge, and these good judges are going to what's he going to say to you? So you become despondent. Also, you say, "Look, I didn't do it. I didn't make it." So, so we hear the parsha, which is always read at this time of year, tells you, "No, you're still alive, aren't you?" Hashem didn't take away your life. He didn't cut you off. He still believes in you. Keep trying. Make another commitment. And that's really the, how you're supposed to walk into Rosh Hashanah. You walk into Rosh Hashanah with a healthy fear, but with also expectations of success. That's why you have, a, you know, there's a, a lot of these contradictions in Rosh Hashanah. Here, Rosh Hashanah is a serious day. You know, in our, our days, our times, maybe I know my parents' generation as well, but I don't know how far back, we have a misunderstanding of what Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are. We have, there are in many holidays in the Jewish calendar. Um, and holidays in general, secular holidays, religious holidays, they're all times when you get together with family. Family gets together, they celebrate together, right? You have a chance to be with your family. 
right? Passover, the, the sacrifice is offered only with your family, right? So everybody gets together. Um, and so people do that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur also, but that's a mistake. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not family holidays. If you look at the traditional Jewish calendar, for instance, the guys who go off to yeshiva, when they go to yeshiva, they don't come home for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. They come home for Sukkot, right? Right after Yom Kippur. Why? You think yeshiva couldn't let them out? Two days earlier, they can go home for Yom Kippur? They can go home for Rosh Hashanah? Of course they could, but they don't. And the reason they don't is because Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are days of judgment. And you want to be in the best place, right, doing the most you can to show that you deserve another year. So you don't, that's not when you go home and celebrate with family. That's serious business. Right? You don't, like, like if I'm up for an evaluation on my job, so they don't, I, I don't go and celebrate with my family that I, that my, new, my job the day I'm being evaluated. I do it the day after I'm evaluated. I'm evaluated yesterday. They said, you did a great job. You're going to keep you another year. So now I celebrate. You don't celebrate before. Right? So you don't go home for Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, you stay in Yeshiva. Rosh Hashanah is a serious day. Right? We often get that confused, and we consider it like a, a holiday where you get together with your family. So that, uh, on one hand, it appears to be a, a nice celebration. We, it says you're supposed to shave you know, before... Um, before, before Rosh Hashanah. You get a haircut before Rosh Hashanah. You also get nice new clothes for Rosh Hashanah. You buy jewelry before Rosh Hashanah. But if it's a day of judgment, for all you know, you're going to be dead the day after Rosh Hashanah. Why are you doing that? Right? So it's so you see, on the one hand, it appears that it is a celebration. Right? It's a happy day. It's a holiday. We dress up, we eat big meals and so forth. On the other hand, it's a day of judgment. And those two contradicting ideas are really the essence of Rosh Hashanah because they're both true. We walk into Rosh Hashanah knowing Hashem will judge us. We also walk into Rosh Hashanah knowing we've done everything we can to show Hashem that we are putting in as much effort as is possible. We're really working at it. And therefore, we're sure He will judge us positively. Right? It's, it's like it says in the halacha that the day right after Yom Kippur ends, you're supposed to believe that Hashem gave you a favorable decision. But right? now everyone can't have a favorable decision, yeah. right? But nevertheless, you're supposed to believe that because it's a celebration and a day of judgment. It's both. And that's why it's different than any other time that, that's, that we have. And it's the same concept as what's going on here. On the one hand, the Torah tells you, if you don't follow the Torah, these terrible things are going to happen. And we know that it's true because it's happened. We've seen it ourselves in our own history. On the other hand, you are still alive. You are still around. So don't be so, you know, concerned that you're going to, that Hashem's going to kill you. Hashem wants you to live. Right? So that's why it begins with this. I tell him that you were all alive. Not just the rich people, not just the poor people, not just the leaders, the wood carriers, the water carriers, the men, the women, the babies. You're all still here. So let's do the best we can. So, and then it says at the uh, at the um, at the end of the section, it tells us that that God makes a covenant with us, um, and He says uh, it says that I'm going to I make a covenant. He says Anochi Kori says Bris has zos Yes, Allah says I'm going to make this covenant with you, the positive and the negative, and He says. In verse 14, And I'm making this covenant with those of you who are here today, as well I'm making this covenant with those who are not here today. So we've got two problems with this statement. Problem number one is, what kind of covenant is this? Covenant is a business deal. It's, a, it's more than business, it's a deal. Hashem says, I'll do this for you, but you got to do this for me. And we say, okay, we'll do this for you, but you got to do this for me. That's a deal, right? You make an arrangement. So Hashem is saying to us, saying to us, I will take care of the Jewish people. You will always exist. You, I will take care of you. I'll be there for you. The world will want to destroy you, but I won't let them. But you have to do the Torah. You do the Torah and be my leaders, my moral, ethical leaders of the world, and I'll do this, right? So I do my side, you do your side. So Hashem told us this at Mount Sinai. He gave us the Torah. 
at Mount Sinai. We said, okay, we'll take the Torah, we'll do what it says, right? We'll follow it. And Hashem says, okay, I'll take care of you. I'll bring you to the land of Israel. Everything will be great. Right? That's the deal. So why is he making a deal again here? He's saying it again. Not only, that's only one problem because we've already said, we already accepted the deal. So now he comes back and do it again. Secondly is, how do you make a deal with somebody who's not here? It says, I'm, I'm going to make this arrangement with you who are here today and those who are not here today. That's what he says. So those who are here today were those who were physically standing there in front of Moshe when he said it. And those who are not here today, that's me and you. We weren't there. So how can he make a deal with us? We're not even alive. So the two problems are, we already made a deal. Why is he making another deal? Secondly is, why do you specifically say this deal applies to those who are here and those who are not here? What's the purpose? If you're not there, how do you make a deal? So the difference is, is that we have different types of covenants. There is a covenant for the Jewish people. That was given when the Torah was given. There Hashem said, the Jewish people have eternity. They will always exist. Their job is to make the world an ethical place. In order to do so, the Jewish people have to keep the Torah. Are you, as a part of the Jewish people, prepared to do this? So at Mount Sinai, we said, yes, we are. So, so that's, that, that was the first covenant. The covenant here has got nothing to do with the Jewish people. It has to do with each of us individually. He says, you have to keep the Torah. If you keep the Torah, right, you'll, I'll take care of you. You don't keep the Torah, all those curses you heard about last week, they're going to happen to you. You want in, you want out. What would you like? So Hashem says to you, right, you, know, you want in or out. So if you choose to be in, then you got to keep it. You want to be out, then you're on your own. Right, so that applies to those people who are here and who aren't here. Those who are here, he asks you, you do it now. Those who aren't here, like us, now we're here. So now we make a, we make a deal. We say, I'm going to keep the Torah, or I'm not going to keep the Torah. If I keep the Torah, right, I'm in. So the Jewish nation has bought in already. That happened at Mount Sinai. The Jewish nation are the ethical leaders of the world. The question is, is are you and I going to be a part of the Jewish nation? Are we going to choose to be a part of it? If we choose to be a part, we're in. If we don't choose to, we're out. That's up to each one of us. So this way, in this parsha, it's talking to us as individuals. And the previous parsha is talking about us as part of the Jewish people. That's, and that, that's the difference between them. Right. Um, Rabbi, yes. One question. There are a lot of people who passed away Erev Rosh Hashanah the last week. Yeah. Is there any significance? I think that it's really more. Um, while there's certainly significance, I think the reason that we notice it is that we'll if you if you do this and you watch closely, you'll notice it happens before every holiday, not just before Rosh Hashanah. And I believe that while there are, you know, there may be such an idea of a per person needing to die at a certain point, that there's also the fact that people um, set milestones for themselves. When a person gets sick, they're laying in the hospital, they're dying, they say, I only want to make it to Rosh Hashanah. If I can make it to Rosh Hashanah, you know, then I'd be happy. If I make it to this milestone, my birthday, to get to see my grandchildren, whatever it is that is in that person's head, they push themselves to stay alive that long. Sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. But they always get closer than they would otherwise. So you have lots of people who, no matter how observant they are, will say, I, I, I want to make it to Rosh Hashanah. It's like I get from people, you know, I sometimes have to tell older people, the younger people, is that they're much easier to deal with in this area. But older people, I tell them, your doctor told me that you can't fast anymore. You're, it's too hard for you. You're too old. It's not good for you. It, gets, you know, it can kill yourself. And I'll always get, I've fasted for 65 years. I'm not going to stop now. That's what they'll say to me, right? Because they, in their head, they, 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 this is their idea of what it means to be a Jew. Well, I have to fast on Yom Kippur. I have to sit in a sukkah. I have to do these things. If I don't do it, what am I doing alive? Right? And they don't listen. And they put their life in their hands. Right? Younger people will listen because they don't have that same feeling of, of that, that it's like forever. They're going to stick this year. Next year, they'll be fine. 
right? They don't feel the same way. But older people, I find that's the case. It's the same idea. They set a goal point for them. I'm, uh, I'm young and healthy. Well, you tell me I can't fast on Yom Kippur, then I have to face the fact that I'm not young and healthy. And that's hard for people to do. So I think it's, I think that's what you see. Um, because it's, you, you know, we have a concept that says that, that on Rosh Hashanah, our life is, is determined how long you're going to live. So you'd say if a person lives till Arab Rosh Hashanah, then it was decided the year before they're not going to live. It's not necessarily the case. See, let's look at it logically. Right? I was just reading something about this yesterday and I was preparing some of my talks. It says, it says that on, um, on Rosh Hashanah, there are, there are three books opened before God. There's the Book of Life, where the righteous people will be written in right away, immediately on Rosh Hashanah, they're written into the Book of Life. And there's a Book of Death, there, it's where the evil people who will be written in immediately. And then there's us, the middle people, the middle, like in the middle of the road. We're not totally righteous, we're not totally evil. So we, it says, are suspended and we wait until Yom Kippur. By how we act between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is where the decision is made for us. But what it's saying is that there are some people who are so righteous that they're on Rosh Hashanah, they're given another year. But that, all right, so there's no way for we, we would know one way or the other. We just don't know. But how are you supposed to tell someone who's alive that he's still alive? Like, how do you notice? It's, it, it doesn't change. But it says that those who are evil will die immediately. It says they, it says they're written in the book of death immediately. So they should as soon as Rosh Hashanah ends that night, there should be like people dying all over the place because they're evil. Right? But you don't see it. And there are people that yeah, you and I may not know them, but by definition, there has to be somebody evil in, in, among the Jews. God forbid it should be, but there there's got to be just percentages, right, that would die immediately, and no one does. So this is what it's telling you. It says like this, that Hashem is the source of life. God is the source of life. You and I, all of us are alive because he plugs us in, so to speak, to him. We have a plug on us, and as long as we're attached to God, we're plugged into God, we're alive. Right? We become detached from God, we begin to die. We don't die. We begin to die. It's like if you're a machine and you have a battery. Right? Like my phone has a battery. So I plug in my phone to recharge, right? As long as my phone is plugged in, I can use it forever because it doesn't use the battery. It won't, it won't need the battery, right? As soon as I unplug it, it'll last three quarters of a day and then I have to plug it in again because it'll eventually die. That's what it means here. You, a person who is, um, uh, a person who's alive, everyone who's alive, is at, they're attached to God. God plugs us in. That he's our life force. Our, everything comes from him. When a person is destined to die that year, they're evil. And it says, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, they're to say, Hashem says, they're written in the book of death. That means he unplugs them. They're not plugged in, but they still have a battery inside of them. And until that battery runs out, they're going to be alive. So that battery might last six months, nine months, three days. Each one's different. But, it's, but there's a battery. They're not going to die immediately. So the definition of life or death is not that your soul is in your body, in this case. It means that you are attached to a source of life or you're not attached to a source of life. As long as you're attached to the source of life, you'll live. Live forever. Right? But as soon as you're detached from the source of life, you'll live until your battery expires, until your body wears out. Then you'll die. But that's really what it means. So that on Rosh Hashanah, when we have our judgment, the next morning, every all the people who are evil don't die. They become unplugged. Some of them, let's say the guy's in his 20s, and he's like that. His life force could last quite a while. You know, he's physically a healthy person. So he can last a while. A person who's not well might not last as long. But they won't die immediately. Otherwise, what, this is what will happen. If we see that, that everybody who's evil dies, Immediately when Rosh Hashanah is over, so what are you, what are you and I going to do that day? We're going to change real fast, and we're not going to do anything wrong, because we just saw, you know, ten thousand people die right in front of our eyes. Like you go to shul, right? You have the judgment of Rosh Hashanah, evening service at the end of Rosh Hashanah, people die right there in shul. Right? It's like crazy. 
uh, I, 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 what would happen is that you'd lose your free will. You'd no longer be able to choose right from wrong. You'd only do right. It's like, you can imagine if the, the, the state here, the province decided they had enough money they, and they want to crack down on speeders. So what they're going to do is they're going to put a policeman in the back seat of everybody's car. And if you speed, he caught you, right? So tell me, if you have a policeman in the back seat of your car, are you going to speed? No. But would you normally? Yeah. But you won't speed with the guy in your back seat, right? So the, the, having, uh, having him right in your back seat, you lose your free will. You can't choose to do something wrong. You're only going to do the right thing. It's the same thing here, that if I, if I, if I see thousands of people die as soon as Rosh Hashanah is over, I'm going to say, you know what? This is really true. It's really going to kill you. Literally, you're going to die. So if I don't fix myself up by Yom Kippur, I'm going to be dead by the end of Yom Kippur. And I don't want to be dead. So I'm going to follow it. Not because I believe, not because I'm righteous, not because I want to do the right thing, because I don't want to die. And that's not how Hashem wants it to be. He wants you to have free will to choose to do the right thing, not to force you to do the right thing. If he wanted to force you, he could force you. Right? It's, 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 there's no purpose in life if you force you. Right? If, I, if, if, if you have a child and you tell the child, you know, make your bed. Every day you have to make your bed. They don't do it. Right? So you, have, you can say, okay, I'm going to give you allowance. If you make your bed every day, you're going to get a $5 a week. Now, not that you're paying them to make their bed, just giving you a reason to give them money. So you say, I'll do that. So that maybe they'll do it. Or you say, you don't make your bed. Every day you don't make your bed. I'm going to make you stay home at night. You won't be able to go out. You have to stay home. So either one of those right, reinforces either the good side or the bad side. But they no longer have their total free will to do what they want. Now they know that if I don't do what my parents say, I'm going to, I can't go out at night. Or if I do what my parents say, they're going to give me money. So I've now corrupted the free will. So we, God doesn't want to corrupt our free will. He wants us to have it. So that's why you don't find people dying right away around Rosh Hashanah time. Who, you see that it happens over a period of time. Also, certainly, Hashem doesn't want even evil people to die. He wants them to change. So he gives them the opportunity to do so. He said, even if a person is judged that they're going to die, they can still change it. The Talmud says that we have different types of judgment. There's a judgment on Rosh Hashanah, but there's also a judgment every day. Every night when we go to sleep, it says our soul leaves our body for a very, very short period of time. And Hashem judges our soul and then sends it back to us. And during that period that He, he judges us every day, while if He judges me every day, what do I need Rosh Hashanah for? What's the purpose? Every day He judges me. Because the, the judgments are different at different times. And Rosh Hashanah, you have a judgment that is that is evaluating all you've done for the year. Every day, it just judges how you were for that day. And a person, over the course of many days, starts to fall into a path. And then Rosh Hashanah judgment comes into play. So they're different. And every if you're judged, a person is judged negatively on Rosh Hashanah, and they're alive the next day, so then what happens is they're, they're, they have the opportunity to change. And then Hashem will plug them in again and they'll be able to stay alive. So that's why you don't see it happening so obviously right, each time. Otherwise, we would no longer have the ability to function. And um, other people can change. Like, let's say if a doctor tell you that you want you have cancer or whatever, and you can't live, you can't make it more than 11 months. So you are lying down, you can't talk, you can't eat, you can't do anything. But people around you start praying. So that was determined the year before. Or people around make you. There's there are different levels, right? In other words, if a person who gets very sick and they're they're getting close to dying, it doesn't mean that they were judged that they would die because they may not die. They may not. It might be that they don't die because a hundred people pray for them, right? That's why yeah. they didn't die. But if Hashem judged them to die, they're going to die. He judges them. If that was the final judgment, and after everything's done, they'll die. But prayer, you know, Hashem tempers his judgment. He says, yeah, this person's going to die unless they repent. 
or unless this changes, or unless people pray for him, right? Then it changes, okay. right? Prayer has the ability to change anything. And even if there are occasions where somebody dies, like we pray for someone and it doesn't help, right? they die. So does that mean that our prayers were, were lost? No, it doesn't mean that. The, Hashem wants us to pray. We decide that we want to pray for this purpose. The answer could be no. You might say, people can't live forever. You know, your grandmother is 115 years old. I'm not going to let it, she's not going to live till 200. It's just not going to happen. Right? You can pray all you want. But so does that mean the prayers are useless? They're not useless. It means that the, no. the prayers will be accepted and something either directly or indirectly will happen, but we don't know to who or how or when, but they will happen. So it could be that I pray for this person to get better and they don't get better, but somebody else in their family might, or something else might happen, because the prayers have an effect. We, we try to make prayers have an effect in the way we want them to, the direct way that we want them to, but they don't have, we don't have necessarily have an effect in the way that that we want. Sometimes it goes other ways. But sometimes it's up to other people. Like when people say, okay, it should sure. get better, I'll make the shuva. Or if you. Yeah, for the best example is like, why would Hashem take a person that's say 35 years old and put him in a coma? They're in a coma. They can be in a coma for a year. Right? What happens in a coma? You can't eat, you can't drink, you can't do mitzvahs, you can't interact with people, nothing. What do I need this person for? What is this person in the world for? They're not bettering themselves. They can't do mitzvahs. They can't help people. They can't talk. They can't do anything, they're, right? So, so are they being punished? Well, they're not dead. They're alive still. Life is already is a blessing. So what is it? What is that person? So the purpose of that person, you can correlate to another type of person, which is a baby. When you have a baby, and if you don't take care of that baby, the baby will die. The baby can't feed itself, can't change itself, can't do anything for itself. So when, so why did Hashem make babies like that? Why doesn't Hashem make a baby at least take care of itself? So it doesn't need a parent. Like what if a parent gets lost or something happens? The, the, the baby can take care of himself, but Hashem doesn't. He makes it that babies have to have someone to take care of them or they'll die. The reason for that is, is that it needs the, you have a baby to teach you, the mother or the father, to be kind, to give to care about others. So therefore, that child's existence is totally there for you. There to, for you to be kind, for you to learn. They have no they have no mitzvahs, they're a baby, right? Same thing with a person in a coma. When a person's in a coma, they have no, they can't do anything wrong, they can't do anything right. They can't do anything. But, but the community needs to learn how to be kind. The community needs to learn how to help people. The community needs to learn how to how to be there to take care of someone. You know, you have a, you know, let's say a person, you know, forty year old woman gets into a, into a coma, right? So the women in the community have to change her. They have to make sure she's fed. They have to to wash her. The men come and they pray for her. Right? People do things for her. She can't respond. She can't do anything for you. She can't say thank you. Nothing. She is totally here for you, for you to improve yourself. That's why she's here. So that's why those things happen like that. It's a baby and an older person or a sick person or like that. And otherwise, you know, it's, it's interesting that it says that it used to be before the days of Jacob, when a person was prime for a person to die, they would sneeze and they would die. That's what it is. That's why you say gesundheit when people sneeze. That you should have a long life. Because it's, it used to be that people died when they sneezed. And then along came Yaakov, and he pleaded with God that people should get sick before they die. So they have the knowledge that they're going to die, so they can, they can like, take care of all their affairs. They can make up with people, and they can see their family. They can do whatever they need to do before they die. Right? Which means that sickness is a blessing. Better than just, hey, it's time for you to die, boop, you're just dead. That was how it used to be. Now you go through sickness, long sickness, short sickness, hard, not hard. You go through it, that's considered a blessing because you're still alive and you're here and you can, you know you're not going to live longer than, let's say, you know, maybe you live six months, nine months, a year, maybe you live a day, but you'll know, but, you know, you have some time. 
So you make up with your wife, you make up with your kids, you make up with your friends, right? You be, you know, you you make sure that before you go, you take care of everything. That's a blessing, right? That's one of the positives of how how we look at the world. So we don't always see sickness as a bad thing. Sometimes sickness is a good thing. Um, compared to death, it's a good thing. Okay. Um, So let's take a look at um, the end of 109.1 and 109.0, or actually the top of the next page. It says, HaMitzvah Zos, Asher Anochi Mitzvah Hayom, Mitzvah Hayom, the mitzvah that I'm commanding you today, Lo Niflas Hi Mimcha, Lo Rechoka Hi, Lo B'Shemayim Hi, Lemor, Mi Alelanu. Instead of reading it through, I'll tell you. This commandment that I'm commanding you today is not hidden from you, it's not far away. It's not in heaven that you have to say, who's going to go up to heaven and get it for me so that we can li listen and do it? It's not across the ocean. So you used to say, who's going to go across the other side of the ocean and go get it for us so that we can do it? Rather, the mitzvah is very close to you in your mouth and your heart to do. So he doesn't say, these are the mitzvahs, right, and the mitzvahs you can do. He says, this is the mitzvah. There is a mitzvah that I'm giving to you, and this mitzvah is not far away from you, and it's not hidden from you, it's not too hard. I think you have to get someone else to do it. You can do it yourself. Right? So what is that supposed to be saying to us? Right? They're like, they're, they're, you actually think that like, Hashem's going to give a mitzvah and you have to go up to heaven to go get it? Or you have to go to China to go get it? So well, what is it referring to? So the Comment, different commentaries different, say different things, but one of the most prevalent ones is that this mitzvah is talking about is the mitzvah of tshuva, of repentance. And that this mitzvah of tshuva is something that every one of us has the ability to accomplish. What is that? The mitzvah of tshuva is, as, as appropriate as it is for this time of year, is we're about, right, we have been given the Torah, and we're not going to, and it is a known fact, you're going to make mistakes. There is no such thing as a person in the world who does only good and has never done wrong. That's what the to we learn that from the Talmud. Right? The people do wrong. We all do wrong. We do things we shouldn't do. We do things we want to do. We do. We get upset. We have difficult days. We do things we shouldn't do. So Hashem creates a mitzvah called tshuva. Tshuva is to reinvent oneself as the person who no longer did the sin that you did before. So I'm now. I got, I got angry at you yesterday. I am now repenting from that, from that, and I will not get angry at people. I'm working to not get angry at people. Therefore, I am doing the mitzvah of tshuva. That's the mitzvah song. It's not talking about mitzvahs. It's talking about mitzvah, singular. There, this mitzvah that I am commanding you today, that's the mitzvah of repentance. It's not far away from you. It's not hidden from you. It's not on the other side of the world. Don't say to me, how am I supposed to repent? I'm so busy. Don't say to me, how am I supposed to repent? I don't have any money. Don't say to me, how am I supposed to repent? I'm the rabbi. I'm not supposed, nobody is supposed to think that I do things wrong. I'm supposed to only do things right. What am I going to do? Get up in front of people and say I made a mistake? They're going to fire me. They're not going to have respect for me. He says, no. The mitzvah, this mitzvah of tshuva is for everybody. Nobody can say it's too hard, it's too far, it's too big, it's too small, it's, too, it's below my dignity, it's above my dignity. It's a mitzvah you have to do. Right? Different mitzvahs have different rules, but this mitzvah says you need to accomplish it. And and that's why it says the mitzvah tshuva. The mitzvah tshuva, especially now, before we get to the holiday season, it's extremely important. How do, what, what do we do with tshuva? How do we do it? So tshuva has a formula. Tshuva is that a person does something they shouldn't do. Now, you might, you might know when you do it or right after that you shouldn't have done it, but you still enjoyed it. Like if you, you added an overwhelming desire for a cheeseburger and you went down to McDonald's and had a cheeseburger, right? Although I don't know if you really had a cheeseburger if you went to McDonald's. It could be you had a pretend cheeseburger. But if you got, you went and you did it. Now, you have to figure out, you now, what do you do about that? Am I de I'm, because God says you can't eat a cheeseburger. God created me. I'm supposed to follow his rules. So I should be dead. I mean, if you create a robot, the robot has to do what you want it to do. So I have to do what Hashem tells me. I should be dead. Hashem says, no. I know there are going to be times when you're going to slip up. So I want you to, do number one, regret what you did. You did something you shouldn't do. 
Yes, you enjoyed it when you did it. It tasted good. It was cheaper than a kosher hamburger, and, it, and you enjoyed it. But I want you to regret it. If you regret it because it was the wrong thing to do, and I want you to say that you regret it. And then I want to put, I'm going to put you in the same situation again, where you're going to want to have a cheeseburger, and I want you to say no. Don't do it. In that case, right, you're not, you're not going to do it. You, 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 at that point, right, that's repentance. Like the Rambam says that a person has to go through that process, and in the end you have to be in the exact same situation again, and not sin. That shows that you've accomplished tshuva, rep changing. Right? It's not easy to do. Nobody says it's easy. Right? It's very, it's very difficult. First thing is you have to remember the things you've done wrong. And then you have to really regret it. And if you really regret it, and then you go through a process of soul searching, then you make sure that if the occasion arises again, that you don't do it again. That's it. You end it at that point. And it doesn't happen again. That's true, but that's the midst of it's talking about. And it uses very colorful wording. Right, that you have to go across the ocean and go up into the heavens. But that's because people have all kinds of excuses. Right? Uh, in today's age, modern times, it's 2015. You tell me I've got to, I can't eat milk and meat together. It's modern times. It's modern times. What is all this all funny stuff about marriage? Right? People always have the answers. Um, you know, I'm out of town. I'm not in my normal place, and it's so hard to keep kosher here. I'm on the other side of the world, so you know, I'll start. I'll keep kosher when I go back home. It, it says it's not so far away from you. You can keep it. It's not up in the heavens that you can't reach it. It's not hard for you. It's not hidden from you. Whatever excuse that we have to break the rules doesn't apply. You have to follow the rules. You make it, but but. I, I accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes. God says, I don't expect you to be perfect. I expect you're going to make mistakes. But I expect you're going to regret them. And that you're going to learn from them. And you'll grow. And that's why that mitzvah is here. And it says, it ends with, Ki koro hadavar, Because it's really close to you, this thing. It's not far away. It's not high up. It's close. Ma'od, very much so. Beficha ulevavcha lasoso. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart to do. That's what the, how, how he closes it, right? And then he says a very important, um, ulti, it's not an ultimatum, but it's a choice. He says, Re'e, look, I'm putting in front of you today, on the one side I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, you can have life and good, or you can have death and evil. It's your choice. You can have one or the other. That, I, that you would love the Lord your God, you will walk in his ways, you'll guard his mitzvahs, you'll follow his laws, right? um, and, and, and you will inherit the land. He says, so it's up to you. But look, I'm placing a choice in front of you. You have free will. You're not an animal. I, you, know, you know the difference between a human and an animal? The major difference is that an animal has, doesn't have the ability to choose. A dog eats what a dog eats. You don't have to go and figure out what kind of food this dog likes. He likes dog food. He's a dog. Cats, right, you're not going to say, oh, this cat, well, this cat, he won't eat milk. Cats eat milk. Right? You can have a human that will eat milk and a human that won't eat milk. You have a human that likes spicy food and a human that likes bland food. You have a human that likes sweet food and one that likes salty food. But animals are animals. They have no free will. They eat. They do what they do. An animal procreates. Doesn't have a relationship with its spouse. It has children. That's it, and moves on. An, a an animal can't do bad. If a dog bites you, you don't put him in jail. Say, okay, I'm putting that dog in jail, and teach him you better not bite people. He's a dog. Dogs bite people. So you either have a dog that'll bite people, or he won't bite people. If he'll bite people, you have to kill him. You don't bite people. Doesn't bite people. You can live with him. Right? Human beings have the ability to change. We have free will. And that's what he means here. I'm putting in front of you life and death. Which one do you want? I'm giving you, here, here's your choice. Which one would you like, life or death? Life comes with good. Death comes with bad. You want to live a good life? You have life. You want to live a bad life? You have death. Which would you like? You can choose either one. Only human beings have that ability. That's why it says that if a person follows Torah, Right, where they choose to do the right thing, 
right? It says that that's the definition of a hu of humanity, of a human. It chooses to do right, the right thing. An animal can't. An animal can't. You can have an, an like you know an animal can choose to do what an animal does. If you have a Saint Bernard, you can train that Saint Bernard to save people's lives. Right? But the animal doesn't realize that it's choosing to save a life. It's do it's it's going to get a cookie, so it's doing it. Right? It's doing whatever it's taught to do. You and I, when we see somebody in danger, we have we got a million things go through our head. I, I should help them, but maybe I, maybe there's nothing wrong. Well, I should help them. Well, maybe they're the guy who's beating up that person is stronger than me. They'll beat me up. Well, I should help them. Well, maybe they deserve it. I should help them. Well, I don't have the time. I got to look the other way. Whatever it is that goes in our mind, we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until we choose to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Animals can't do that. Animal will immediately act, positive or negative, but they certainly won't debate an issue. That's what we have the ability to do, and that's what the Torah is telling us. You can choose right from wrong, and and by choosing right from wrong, that's how you can do tshuva, because you choose wrong, you chose wrong. Right? And he, he goes on. He says, he says. Um, yeah, the heaven, the earth, life and death. I'm putting in front of you a blessing, va'klala, and a curse. Who bechartah bechayim? Now, now, up until now, he just tells you you have a choice. Now he's telling you you've got a choice. You want my advice? Take life. That's all. That's what he's saying. You should choose life. Right? When up until now, I can give you good or bad, life or death. Right? Whichever one you want, you want. But if you'd like my advice, take life. And that's what he says. And you should love God. You should listen to his voice. You should attach yourself to him. For God is your life. The Arachimecha and the length of your days, the Shabbos Aladama, that you live on the land, that God, God promised your forefathers. God promised your forefathers you're going to have a place to live. You're going to have land, right? But you have to make a choice. What do you want, right? And that's how the Torah goes. And it's why it's so appropriate right before Rosh Hashanah. Because in Rosh Hashanah, when we walk into Rosh Hashanah, we want to walk in with a real belief in our mind that we are going to be better people next year than this year. Nobody expects that you're not going to make a mistake, right? You're not supposed to go in and make a commitment and say, God, I'm going to keep the entire Torah. Nobody believes you. Not possible. You can't. If you didn't do it today, you can't do it tomorrow. But if you go in and, and you can't even go in and say, God, I'm not going to speak Lush and Hora again. I'm not going to believe you either. And you don't believe you. You have to say something you can accomplish. I give a talk before Yom Kippur, and we'll talk about it before Yom Kippur at length. But if you want to change, you have to change in small ways. But if you continue to change in small ways every year, and if you look back after 10 years, you've changed in big ways. But if you try to change in big ways, it doesn't work. Like I, I remember when I, I first got married, I would say to my wife something like, "Could would you be able to make dinner now?" And she say, "Say okay, but you have to, but you should do this." In other words, as if she was in the middle of, let's say, moving some books, and I'd say, "Could you make dinner now?" So she'd say, "Okay, but you need to move the books because I got to go make dinner." But she'd always say something like, um, "I'd say, can you make dinner now?" I'd say, "Yeah, but you should quit smoking now." In other words, I, so I'd ask her to do something you know, that was relatively small, and she had, she'd say, yes, we have to do this enormous thing. I'd, I'd say, what does one got to do with the other? It's got nothing to do with each other. You have, you know, it, it's, it's got to be a balance, right? And the Torah is telling us that uh, if you want to change, right, it has to be something that is a balance, that is a certain amount. You can't, I can't just say, okay, you know, I'm going to be totally a good person tomorrow. It's not possible. If I wasn't one today, I won't be one tomorrow. But I can be a better person tomorrow. I can do one thing tomorrow. I can do two things tomorrow that I didn't do today. If somebody comes in on they and they want to become religious, and they come and meet with me in my office, and they say, okay, this sounds great. Tomorrow I'm going to do it. I always say to myself, then in three weeks, I'll never see this person again. Because you can't do it in a day. You can't go from being not kosher, not Shabbos, not anything, to everything in one day. Because what will happen is in, within three weeks, you'll hate it. You'll hate it because your whole life will be thrown upside down. You won't know what you're doing, and you'll, you won't enjoy it anymore. Life will be a burden. But if you say, okay, from now on, 
you know, I'm going to keep Shabbos. And, I have to say, and they'll say, what does that mean? It means I'm going to go on Friday night and make Kiddush. That's what I'm going to do. Then I'll go out to go out to a club. But I'm going to make Kiddush. So that's step one. Okay, that's good. Step two, you're, now you're going to make Hamotzi. Step three, you're going to have a sh you're going to keep Shabbos. After a while, they'll be in step ten. They're going to keep Shabbos Friday night. Everything Friday night. Then they'll start working in the daytime. After about four or five months, they're going to keep Shabbos. They can't do it in one day. It takes time, mm -hmm. right? That's the idea of the choice, and that's why Hashem gives us the choice to be able to make a choice and to move along, and that's why He gives us tshuva because He knows we will mess up, so that we can we can change. If you don't have the ability to mess up you'll be dead. Hashem allows us that ability. Mess up, but fix it. Make a mistake, but fix it. Right? And whenever you work for somebody, and if they say to you, if you make a mistake, I'm going to fire you, you don't want to work there. Who wants to work there? Everybody makes mistakes. If he says, if you make a mistake, and you learn from your mistakes, I'll keep you. But if you make mistakes, and you keep doing it, the same mistake, that means you don't care. You don't care about your work. I don't want to keep you. God says, I'm giving you mitzvahs. If you make mistakes, if you if you keep making the same mistake over and over, it means you don't care. You have no reason to live. It's the same. But if you're going to start changing, and you're going to work at it, and you're going to make less mistakes, but not, but still make some, and the next year you'll make even less, then uh, then then I want you here. That's the kind of person I want. And that's what the Torah tells us.